Hello, and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D, and I talk about its lore, and its history, and what it's like to fight in-game as well. With the almost unlimited number of creatures that are featured in D&D, it's really hard to pick which monsters I would like to draw, so instead, I like to use your suggestions for monsters that you'd like to see, and hear the lore and mythology of. So if you have a particular favourite creature, or something just strikes you while you're watching this, make sure to leave that down below in the comments section because I add all of your suggestions to my to-draw list, which I hand to my patrons every single month over on Patreon. It's then up to my lucky lucky patrons who get to vote on which ones of your suggestions they'd like to see in what order. And this time they have chosen the fantastically incendiary topic of the Half-Dragon, which is first suggested by Inquisitor Thomas, someone who suggested a fair few of the creatures that I've managed to draw so far on this channel. So thank you so much for being a fan for such a long time, Inquisitor Thomas. And let's get started with today's video. Now, players have actually had access to some version of this type of creature through the draconic bloodline path of the sorcerer class, and there may be many homebrews that allow players to experiment with draconic heritage, my own included, if that's actually finished and posted online. And if it is, then I'll make sure to leave a link to that down in my description box, where hopefully I should have made something that lets players use uh, half dragons as a playable species. But dragons, or specifically chromatic dragons, tend to be aloof and superior beings who regard mortals as little more than beasts and sometimes even as vermin. They generally tend not to, therefore, breed outside their own species and are known to even have issues with breeding outside of their own specific scale colour. What I mean by that is that a red dragon usually sees things like blue dragons, for example, as an example of an inferior type of chromatic dragon. Last Dragon December, I covered that they do sometimes breed, and this will lead to purple dragons, a homebrew which I provided, but has its claws entrenched in the lore of Dungeons & Dragons since perhaps first edition. But these dragons are rare because they don't like to mix their chromatic spectrum. It came as somewhat of a surprise to me, therefore, to discover that half dragons not only exist, but are common enough to have been presented to us in the monster manual, because if a dragon won't breed with even another type of dragon, generally speaking, it should be really unlikely that they're going to breed with something outside of their species, surely. My impression would be that almost all types of dragons would avoid this at all costs, seeing the act of mating with a mortal creature as disgusting, or perhaps abusive, in the same light that we might view those who take advantage of animals in a similar fashion. However, taking the perspective that dragons are godlike creatures, there are various examples of gods in real-world mythology using their power to sire offspring with mortals, and therefore a comparison for this kind of occurrence can be drawn no matter how we feel about it. So we know it's definitely not impossible. In the lore of Dungeons & Dragons and in a lot of mythology, dragons are extremely capable of shapeshifting and transforming into mortal creatures, so physically they would be compatible. And we know that certain types of dragons are interested in studying and can become fascinated with mortal creatures. We know, for example, that metallic dragons are obsessed with mortal creatures, usually humans in particular, certainly when it comes to silver dragons, who revere humans for their tenacity, their courage, and their honour despite their short lives. Green dragons tend to collect noteworthy humans and obsess over their accomplishments, stealing them or hoarding them as their own, viewing mortals as trophies. Blue dragons also adore the concept of being worshipped by mortals and enjoy having messengers who live influential lives in mortal cities and relish in using them as messengers to a further their cult-like practices and also to keep the blue dragon in the loop about current world affairs and how people might perceive them. To this end, in an article known as Scale and Claw, printed in Dragon Magazine number 284 in 2001, Steve Kenson hypothesizes that dragons may breed with mortals in order to have powerful servants to undertake tasks that the dragon considers beneath itself within mortal society, but still must have accomplished to further their insidious plots and schemes. Alternatively, it could, for whatever reason, be the case that a dragon falls madly and deeply in love with a mortal creature, having offspring with them, and then simply outliving their partner due to their exceptionally long lives. As I've mentioned before, dragons can shapeshift, so it could be 
that a dragon seeking to enjoy a more mundane life might transform into, let's say, a human or an elf or a dwarf, and live out the entirety of a mortal lifetime for somewhat of a break from being a dragon. Their partner may never know of their draconic heritage. Although, could they truly have been in love if one partner has hidden such a massive part of their life, and therefore, I guess, lied about absolutely everything that they are? Potentially not. But this has happened multiple times with multiple godlike creatures in a variety of pantheons throughout human history. The most notable example of this kind of behaviour that springs to mind would be Zeus, the leader of the gods of Olympus in Greek mythology. Zeus famously transformed into various creatures and also multiple different mortal men in order to pursue just about any person he found attractive through his misguided unions with these people, numerous demigods, beings with some aspect of divinity while still tied to mortality, were produced. To name only a few of his attempts to romance people or creatures other than his wife, we know that Zeus transformed into an apparently very, very sexy burning eagle, the son of a well-known king known as Amphitryon, a satyr, a ball of fire, his own daughter Artemis, a phoenix, a shower or rain of gold, a white bull, an ant, an eagle, and this time the eagle wasn't even on fire. Apparently some rain, a peculiar bird known as a lapwing, a swan, a star, a bear, a shepherd, a goose, a snake, and perhaps most alluring and attractive of all creatures, a vulture. All of these at various different times, most of which actually succeeded in seducing people somehow. It's a wonder that humanity even made it to 2020, to be honest. Through these various disguised extramarital romances, he sired no fewer than 65 children, all of whom had some kind of godlike attributes, the most memorable of these being Heracles, or Hercules, depending on whether you prefer Greek or Roman mythology. So it's likely that these creatures who are superior to mortals perhaps have an appetite that we cannot possibly comprehend, or that both Zeus and the dragons of D&D just really love paying alimony to short-lived races. In my research surrounding gods and dragons and demigods siring various sort of mortal, sort of divine offspring, I came across one potential inspiration for half-dragons as we know them, or their creation. Either way, they're likely to stem from a creature called Zmew, a pronunciation that I'm almost certainly butchering. Z-M-E-U. Zmu is how I'm going to pronounce it, is a draconic creature who features in Romanian folklore, and who can likely trace his inspiration to a Slavic beast dragon known as Zmay, Z-M-A-Y, a shape-shifting anthropomorphic dragon who has an obsession with charming and wooing mortal women. The Zmu figures prominently in many Romanian folktales as the manifestation of the destructive forces of greed and selfishness. Often they are some sort of powerful thief, stealing things of enormous value, which a hero of some kind, known in Romanian folk tales as Prince Charming, or the handsome youth, is capable of battling Zemu for and returning to its rightful place. For example, in a well-known story known as the Ballad of the Knight Graucanu? Graucanu? Graucanu. G-R-E-U. C-E-A-N-U. Please, for the love of Bahamut, if anyone actually knows these Roma Romanian pronunciations, please let me know down in the comments, because I've never felt more out of my depth in terms of pronunciation. Either way, in this ballad, we shall say, Zmu steals the sun and the moon from the sky, which blankets the entire world in darkness, and it's this handsome youth's task to retrieve them both from it. The Zmu has a ton of magical and destructive powers, which we associate very much with the dragons of D&D, including the ability to shapeshift, they have uncanny strength, the ability to fly with these massive wings, and all sorts of magical powers at its disposal, but all of its tricks and powers are no match for justice, righteousness, and apparently a handsome youth. So we know that anthropomorphic, dragon-like creatures exist in exist in mythology. We know that dragons can shapeshift. We know that they do breed with mortal creatures. And when they do, they have half-dragon offspring. And these creatures generally have some sort of silhouette, the general shape, the general form of their mortal 
parent, but have various aspects, both physical and magical, that tie them to their draconic heritage, which is why I've drawn a kind of human-dragon hybrid here. The version that we see, the illustration that we see in the Monster Manual, looks more like a kind of dragonborn meets dragon, and looks particularly fearsome. But because there is no strict rules for what happens with a half-dragon, we don't know how much dragon is in the mix of this demigod-like creature. We are given an example of a stat sheet for half-dragons to use if we so desire, but the more important rules come from the half-dragon template, a list of rules for DMs to create half-dragons so they can be pretty much whatever the DM wants to accomplish with a half-dragon. Because we're told a beast, humanoid, giant, or monstrosity can become a half-dragon, that's right. You can have a half-dragon owlbear, you can have a half-dragon dog, you can have a half-dragon cat, you can have any of the playable species as half-dragons, or pretty much anything in the Monster Manual. I mentioned this with my Succubus video, but again, the Monster Manual is basically just the waifu catalogue for dragons, apparently. The inclusion of giants is really confusing because dragons and giants generally despise each other, so the idea of them having a mixed creature is very peculiar, but then you could also open up a plot for your players wherein a dragon and a giant attempt perhaps, or somebody else attempts perhaps, to end a war between dragons and giants by producing some hybrid offspring, by growing them in a test tube, you know, that kind of thing, making the ultimate warrior that is a mix between giant and dragon. Maybe that's how you get a Tarask. Either way, we are instructed to use the stats from whatever the mortal creature's counterpart is as a baseline, and then to alter those with the half-dragon template. In addition to the normal mortal senses, half-dragons gain blind sight up to 10 feet, and beyond that they have dark vision within 60 feet of themselves. And they become resistant to a type of damage based on the resistances present in their draconic parent. For example, a black or a copper dragon contributing to this hybrid creature would grant them acid resistance, a blue or bronze would grant them resistance to lightning, and so on and so on and so on. Dragons are on average as intelligent as the average human the moment that they hatch from their egg, and this level of early development crosses over into their offspring such that a half-dragon is born knowing how to speak draconic. They may not be as intelligent as a full dragon whelp, but they never need to be taught draconic, they simply acquire that alongside any other languages they're supposed to know, or would learn during their lifetime. They also gain the ability to breathe the breath weapon of their parent dragon. We're told to use the stats of a parent dragon's forms as a wormling, a young dragon, or an adult dragon, based on whether or not this creature ends up being a large or smaller creature, a huge creature, or a gargantuan creature. Essentially, they're not a million miles away from playing a dragonborn, but these creatures are granted the incredible long lives of their draconic parent, and whereas the dragonborn look extremely draconic, half-dragons can be any amount of draconic that seems to fit. The more power that's crossed over from their draconic parent, the more dragon-like they may look sprouting enormous horns, jagged talons, scales, and usually some kind of tail. But those with very little draconic heritage may look almost no different from the mortal species. And perhaps this is how we get the draconic bloodline sorcerer, someone who has very little draconic blood, or whose draconic blood has been diluted over generations, only to re-manifest as soon as they get access to some kind of additional magic, or plumb the depths of their soul to unlock that draconic past. But that does raise a very significant question. What is the difference between a half-dragon and a dragonborn? Well, the dragonborn are very highly requested creatures, and it's been my aim now for years to make some kind of video about the playable species. And I've still not given up on the idea that I may eventually get time to do that. So I won't go into too much depth. But the long and short, the TLDR version, is that the dragonborn are traditionally canonically uh, depicted as being very similar to the way dragons might look, only with a kind of humanoid bipedal form. Their scales can look like pretty much any colour, 
after years of various different dragonborns intermingling and mixed breeding and so on, their draconic heritage, the resistances and breath weapons that they have, is not generally visually discernible based on their scales. They could have, you know, yellow scales, but use a lightning breath weapon, for example. Canonically, at least, they don't have tails, whereas half-dragons almost always seem to. And while both may very well grow wings, half-dragons seem weirdly less likely to. The Dragonborn were created by dragons to serve a purpose. In the original lore, they are essentially slaves, which is why the Dragonborn hate dragons of any creed or caste, because once they emancipated and freed themselves, they wanted nothing to do with their creators. They are essentially, I guess, genetically engineered servants. Dragons using their draconic blood in order to have some sort of starting block to create these creatures, whereas half-dragons are the actual offspring of dragons and mortals. The Dragonborn are a species with a very confirmed look to themselves, who are genetically compatible with one another and tend to have offspring, whereas half-dragons, we are told specifically in many, many cases in the Monster Manual and beyond, are completely sterile and cannot have any children of their own, just like the hybridization of various creatures in the real world. We know that ligers exist, for example, when a lion and a tiger, who are genetically compatible enough in order to have an offspring, will have a mixed creature, a liger, but these creatures are incapable of having stable offspring. And the same is the case for a half-dragon. If a half-dragon were to somehow manage to circumvent this, perhaps magically having children, using a wish spell or something like that, we are told that their blood would continue to dilute over the generations, and that a half-dragon generally re resembles its mortal counterpart in the majority with features of dragons rather than looking very draconic. And that's something that I really wanted to capture here in this creature. I wanted them to look very human. They are humanly dressed with lots of scales and spikes and draconic horns, but with a generally human figure. I actually took a lot of inspiration here from one of the Final Fantasy games. One of my D&D players is a huge, huge fan of Final Fantasy. She plays the MMO and plays a type of creature known as the Ora or Aura, who, as I understand it, are basically half-dragons, you know, sort of draconic humanoids. They could be demonic, I suppose, but they look very draconic, with these strange curve-shaped horns and lots of scales protruding from various parts of their bodies. And I thought this was a fantastic representation of just how I wanted to differ differentiate Dragonborn from half-dragons. So using my own flair, I decided to take a lot of inference from the aura. But I absolutely love this one. I love this kind of blue-green kind of draconic heritage here, which is why she's got this kind of lightning energy that she's manifesting here. And yeah, I really want to use this character as some kind of NPC in a campaign. Let me know how you've used half-dragons in your campaigns in the past. And if you never have, how might you? I'd love to hear your stories. But I had so much fun coming up with this hybrid creature. And if you enjoyed today's video as well, make sure to leave a little like down be below and uh, perhaps subscribe as well, because all of that really, really helps to let YouTube know if I'm doing a good job here or not. And despite our draconic heritage, we are just little mortal hatchlings ourselves, growing into the mighty half-dragons that we hope become here at the Arcane Forge, so we need your help to do that. If you really like this drawing and you'd like a copy for yourself, make sure to check out my Patreon page, where backers at various levels get access to multiple perks, which include things like copies of every drawing I do each month, including this one. So I'll make sure to leave a link to that down below in my description box, but until next time, if you start to manifest draconic scales and a very, very long tail, maybe take a look at that DNA test and see if one of your parents is secretly a dragon, because you could be about to inherit some fairly serious magical power. And until next time, happy monster hunting.